Great. Well, thank you everyone for logging in. It's really a pleasure to be here to discuss this topic of um, what's going on with uh, liquidity and more, most importantly, how do we think about them or how do we want to change the way we think about them given current events. And so the two papers that we're going to have in this session could not be more timely, more exciting, more going after the, what I think are some of the big questions when it comes to um, this topic. And so it's really a pleasure to be here. I thought that for these 15 minutes to introduce, I would discuss a little bit of what I think are, uh, make three points to discuss what do I think are some of the important questions involving treasuries, central bank digital currency, which are the topics of the two papers, and then thirdly and related to them of the interactions that both of these have with fiscal policy or with the solvency of the government, if you want, insofar as both digital currency by the central bank or treasuries are nothing but state liabilities, which ultimately are backed by the fiscal situation of the government. But let me start with treasuries. For a long time in macro finance or in finance or in macro, we worried in the sense of we're excited, researched, why is it that treasury yields are just so low? Maybe it's because of the safety they give. Maybe it's because of their liquidity and, their, and the ease of which you can sell them. Maybe it's because they, they are very much used for collateral and we develop many theories of why that emerged. But more generally, whether it's safety, liquidity, collateral, that treasury seemed to be special. There were special assets and we worried about understanding that specialness. Now, some of that specialness was tied to the US dollar. The US faces, has this exorbitant privilege um, that it, this exorbitant privilege that its currency tends to appreciate in crisis. And so when we speak of, uh, and so that during crisis, money tends to flow to the US. And when we say flow to the US, it doesn't flow to cash, it flows to treasuries in order to earn a little bit of the yield. And so trying to understand what's special about treasuries is in part trying to understand why the dollar is special. We also learned, secondly, that supply matters. Very influential work by Annette Pissing Jorgens and Arvind Krishnamurti and many others. It seems that the demand curve slopes downward, that changes supply seems to change that yield. So to try and understand these treasuries, it was important to understand what was driving that supply, that demand curve downwards. And finally, fourthly, aside from why is there a yield? Is it tied or driven by the dollar? And third, why is the demand curve for the treasury slope down? The financial crisis of 12 years ago taught us or inspired us to write a lot of research on the role of regulation. Why is it that so many financial intermediaries need to hold safe assets? And those safe assets are in most countries, in almost all countries, ultimately the asset, the liabilities issued by the government. Regulations of all sorts following the, cri the, cr following the crisis increase the benefits of treasuries insofar as both how liquid how safe, and how safe they are and how much they must be used, not just want to be used for collateral. In some ways, in the last 10 years, one can jokingly say, partly only jokingly, that while people in finance, uh, they were trying to explain equities were chasing behavioral factors, research in finance trying to understand bond markets or treasuries was chasing instead regulations. What regulation to store which market? How can we use it to test and interpret different theories? Now, these questions are important, which one it is, because in part because in a more macro perspective, we need to manage the debt. We need to choose how much to issue, at what time, with what rhythm, and that will have large potentially fiscal costs for the government. Among this, uh, uh, against this backdrop in this setting, March 2020 came along. And so what happened? Well, yields jump up extraordinarily. Even in comparison with OIS rates, the, there was all of a sudden an inconvenience yield. This in spite of not much happening to inflation expectations or default risk. And while, and it happened very suddenly, as well as once the Fed's actions intervened, we had that it disappeared relatively quickly. Note that if one thinks purely of yields and the fundamentals, it seems um, surprising that the Fed's actions in April and May and so on were, if anything, inflationary, and yet yields came down, making it unlikely, or at least, or yes, unlikely that this shift in yields was driven by um, change inflation expectations, because if nothing else, the timing seems to be wrong. Not to mention that direct measures of expectations don't seem to, uh, to confirm that. So the yields, we went from discussing why is it that we have um, um, 
such negative yields to all of a sudden the world turned backwards and we were trying to understand why the yield so high. Second, the world also turned backwards because the dollar, as opposed to appreciating, depreciated during this time. People took money out of the US and to a very large extent, approximately 250 billion during that month. All of it or most of it in bonds, not bills. So it wasn't quite a, a complete say lack of faith in the US dollar or in particular, it was not purely just about the role of the dollar because then you would think they would affect bonds and bills not differentially and yet it did. Third, there has been um, an increase in supply in the last decade. The, the US government has been running very large federal deficits. There's been lots of issuance. Debt to GDP has kept on increasing. So while the supply shot up in March by around 200 billion, still, one would not certainly expect back in February that would have had such a big impact given how much supply had increased over the previous 10 years. Why now? It seems that the slope as opposed to the level is what mattered when it came to the path of that, that it was about the suddenness of it. Because simply looking at how downward sloping the demand for treasuries were from the work that had spent 10 years doing this, it's just very hard to understand why those 200 billion made such a big difference. Why was it that? Oh, and finally, when it comes to regulation, when one looks at the needs to hold treasuries on which different banks and others had to hold them, well, all of those, if anything, got relaxed during the crisis. And so, insofar as governments and regulators said they did not want to stop the flow of credit, so if anything, the demand for treasuries should have, uh, the demand of treasuries may in part have declined. So, what is it that drove this? Why did these things turn backwards? So the first paper in today's program, or maybe it's the second paper, I forget the order, but the first paper that I'm discussing um, points to perhaps it was the regulation of treasury dealers. We had an expansion in the supply of bonds that even though it was only 200 billion, and I say again, only relative to the decade, certainly very large for a month, the key is again the slope in that they didn't have enough balance sheet space. And on top of it, we're facing regulation, particular hedge fund and dealing with the hedge funds through the supplementary like supplemented liability ratio. Oh, I always forget these names of these programs. Um, compensate dealers required compensation, supplemental leverage ratio, compensation for dealers for balance sheet, uh, as if there was an increase in risk aversion. They write a very nice model, a la Vianos Vila, that means that there's an increased volatility in yields, that they need compensation to bear these risks. Um, and on top of it, there's a regulation putting to it. Crucial is their uh, data on direct holdings versus reverse repos and why is it at the different rates change. So that seems to me like a very plausible hypothesis. But let me put forward three alternatives. One, that maybe demand is just much more volatile, that it's not supply. And the reason why I say this is that 13 months ago, I was puzzling over a different puzzle, which was why is it that in spite of there being what seemed to be abundant reserves issued by the Federal Reserve, a few disruptions in a few days in September led to an enormous spike up of the federal funds rate. In some ways, that was more surprising than the Treasury's one in March. Why? Because the federal funds rate at a point rose above the discount window, therefore creating a true arbitrage opportunity for some of the banks that had access to the discount window. It seemed that people just all of a sudden went for cash for reasons that research has tried to explain ever since. This desire for cash is large, is volatile. This is consistent with an enormous increase in the demand for cash also in March. And why is it that the, we didn't see the T-bills yield spike even as people were trying to get out of bonds? So there's something special about cash, about bills, about short maturity government bonds that treasury bonds don't seem to share. There's some enormous desire for it that fluctuates. And that is an alternative explanation to the regulations. Another alternative is that maybe, just maybe, financial intermediaries expect a big financial contraction and therefore the demand for treasuries will have fallen persistently precisely because of the regulations that were forcing us through multiple channels to hold lots of treasuries to, in, to use in order to produce all types of financial contracts. Maybe there is a financial slump or at least a fear that there was and so the treasuries are no longer needed. Moreover, insofar as this crisis may lead to the opposite change relative to the previous one, it may lead to financial liberalization plus a tightening insofar as governments turn to private credit both to fund their own liabilities as well as to keep the economy going, perhaps we just have an expectation that we won't need as much treasuries. And this would be the other side of why we start needing so many more treasuries after 2008. Or maybe it is just because of the expectation that maybe we're heading for a depression and we don't need so much banking or financial business. And then finally on the role for the dollar. 
the US over the last couple of years and weaponized the dollar, especially its relations with Southeast Asia. That may be part of why this time it was not perceived as quite as safe. In particular, and particularly relevant, is the fact that life insurance in Southeast Asia had enormous, enormous positions on long-term treasury bonds that they were hedging all the time in, um, uh, in the FX market, in the FX swap market. Insofar as uh, that hedging disappeared, and we saw that through a, a, a spike in CIP deviations in March, triggering the expansion of the, of the Fed swap lines, maybe this dumping was precisely the fire sale that the swap lines were meant to prevent and that for a few weeks did not and maybe the real event in april was indeed the swap lines preventing then the foreigners from having to dump all of these and thus re-establishing the dollar as a safe asset with a swap line establishing a liquidity note therefore that what have i done in terms of these expansions note my if you want rhetorical trick is that I ended up coming back to precisely the previous four reasons we had discussed before. Insofar as we spent the last 15 years explaining why the Treasury have a positive convenience yield, why the US is special, why regulations increase supply, I gave you alternative explanations for why maybe it was everything is working backwards, but across the different channels. And I think we'll hear more about it from the author of the paper. Now, aside from the Treasuries, there is excitement over the role of central bank digital currency. One side of it is at CBDC as a replacement for physical cash. And the excitement there comes, one, from the competition with private suppliers, but it's all with, insofar as central banks do it, there may be a removal of anonymity, which may, some people may vary, but that comes with discussions on the extent to which it's produced with seniors for privates or publics, the extent to which it allows knowledge and price discrimination if it's privates, and so on. But once you move away from anonymity and cash itself, People you have been using digital cash issued by banks for decades. The key for that, for, this, for the debit card that I use and all the electronic payments that I make, is that it is backed by the deposits of those banks of the central bank. Digital currencies existed forever. It's reserves the central bank and it's played a fundamental role such that I can say that I use CBDC every day or better. I use private digital currency backed by a CBDC, the reserves of the banks of the central bank. In that sense, the revolution of CBDC may be less about Bitcoin, say, but more about the fact that more and more non-banks financial institutions can now deposit at the central bank, and therefore payments using it are becoming more, and, and that payments using it become faster and more efficient. The threat then is not so much to anonymity in the world of state, but rather to banks, because they bundle their operation of the payment systems with, for instance, the provision of credit. If they lose the provision of the payment system, maybe they will no longer be able to do that. In other words, maybe narrow banks will be on the way, which may actually be good insofar as we're not so worried about failing. Monica and Martin, in the paper they're going to show you, look at a different complementary, not with lending, or not with lending in the sense of long-term lending, I meant mature transformation, but rather the extent to which banks, by accepting deposits and managing the payment system, if you want those deposits, have a complementary with offering credit lines. So if indeed CBDC is all about having non-banks enter this market and compete for the payment systems, insofar as non-banks don't offer credit lines, we may end up with a worse position. Now, this raises important questions. Is this really, this complementarity that they emphasize, is it about at the sector level or at the firm level? Because at the firm level, then we have antitrust considerations to raise, and that is to the extent in which we're letting them uh, abuse this complementarity, not abuse, earn a rent with this complementarity. Likewise, if we are going to have entrance and we think free entry is important into this market, something that hasn't existed in a long time, free entry in the payment system, and that's, I would argue, the good thing about potentially CBDC, then to what extent can we retain the benefits that Monica and Martin emphasize while preserving some competition, and in particular, allowing, allowing for um, some competition of the banking service. This interacts with treasuries. Um, of course, because whether it's government giving you bonds, because the government, now this interacts with treasuries, because the government, of course, issues bonds, but doesn't give you credit lines. So the arguments that Monica make would all, and Martin make would also, um, in some ways, inform the previous discussion. Let me conclude. I'm already one minute behind time. Apologies. I'll take another minute or two. Um, by then making a third point that interacts with the previous ones. Ultimately, CBDC, treasuries, are liabilities of the state. Ultimately, they are backed by the fiscal soundness of the state. 
Now, over the last few months, we've had an enormous fiscal deficit and perspectives that those deficits will stay at least for a while. The debt has exploded all over the advanced economy, not just the US, although let's focus in the US here. Now, how are we going to pay for it? It's a matter of arithmetics that there are three options to pay for it. One is to have unexpected, persistently unexpected inflation. That is very hard to do. A good example is it's almost impossible to buy uh, um, uh, an option that gives you protection against inflation being more than 5% on average over the next 10 years. Why? Because it's very hard for central banks to manage that. On top of it, insofar as the maturity of the debt in the US is very short, and it is very short and got much shorter, the ability of the Fed to all of a sudden, if the maturity of the debt is two or three years, as it is now, the ability of the Fed to generate any significant inflation cumulatively over the next three years is extremely low in practice. So inflating the debt is really not something that's going to happen, I will predict. Second, in a more polarized um, political environment, what we know from the work of Alberta Lezina and many others in political economy is that the chances that we'll have high surplus pay for this debt seem very low for the near future, not to mention, of course, the cost of the pandemic. So I'm left with a third option, which is financial oppression. Financial oppression, in short, can be done in many ways, but I'm defining it here as forcing people to hold treasuries and thus keeping their yield down um, no matter what. Now, by the way, this also raises the ability to inflate insofar as if you force people to hold treasuries, then two-year bonds become the fact of perpetuities that can be inflated away. Well, repression says that we'll have demand for private CBDC. And the existence of CBDC offered not just by banks, but of the complementary of the credit lines that Monica and Martin say may, be, uh, may become particularly important in the next few years. Much of CBDC arose as a way to escape capital controls in countries. That was certainly a big boost to Bitcoin and others perhaps we'll have a new big boost uh, having to do with escape of financial repression. And finally, on debt. Another way to think about it, and one that has attracted, in my view, perhaps even too much attention, is that uh, perhaps since R is less than G, the interest rate on the debt is less than the growth rate of the economy, perhaps it's just a bubble in the debt. And we can just borrow a lot more without great consequence. Let me conclude, though, it, meaning we cannot, we, not only we can do a deficit gamble, but also we can have persistent deficits that last forever, financed by the bubble convenience yield of the excited debt. Let me do those some fi final calculations before I shut up. Um, the there's an economic theorem that the maximum sustained public deficit that you can keep as a ratio of the, of the assets in the economy is given by G minus R. Now, if G minus R is 2%, and the stock of assets in the US economy are approximately 2.7 times GDP, capital stock 2.1 times, then international best position minus 0.5, public debt 1.1, so total assets of roughly 2.7, maybe 3%. That means that if you're gonna have persistent deficits funded by a bubble, that bubble will fund 5.4% of GDP deficit at most. Now, the primary public deficit in the last 10 years, excluding 2020, was 4.8%. So if you think you're going to use the bubble to pay for this, well, the bubble gives you an extra 0.6% relative to what you found. Worse, if R minus G, if G minus R falls from 2 to even 1%, that means that the US would have to cut its primary deficit from the 16.7% level of 2020 that we expect by 14 percentage points over the next 10 years in order to respect the budget constraint. In other words, all I've done is tell you that even if public debt can increase by 20, 30, 70% as a result of R being smaller than G. Of course, the R being the difference in R and G are also mean that that in terms of deficits per annum per year are actually very small. And thus the whole bubble doesn't actually solve the problem and is not an alternative. Thank you very much.